right, cruising down Moana Lane onto South Virginia Street to the Peppermill for the 213th edition of this particular poker vlog. I said last time that here at Peppermill, if it's not a Friday or a Saturday, they should never start a third version of a 0-5-10 game because it always kills the other two. And while I stand by that, today is an exception because they are doing a money giveaway extravaganza. My hope is that Mr. Z wins like five of these drawings today, but uh, we'll see how that goes. The players with the most hours get the most drawing tickets for a series of money giveaways. And I don't think I'm in the top 10 in hours, but I'm probably in the top 20. So I got a decent shot at winning some money back in that regard, but the priority is not the giveaway. The priority is the game itself. I did manage to book losses in three out of four sessions after probably about an $18,000 upswing, which came after what I called on either the last vlog or the one before, I referred to it as a $6,000 downswing. And I had a guy write in the comments and he said, Ben, that is not a downswing. And I kind of thought to myself, well, yeah, but uh, that was the best I could do. By the way, if you think I drove into the pepper mill alone on this day, you're wrong. My son left three of his friends behind in the backseat. Sure enough, I'd get into the room with two games already in progress, despite the fact the giveaways hadn't even started yet. There are a lot of people who show up only because the giveaways are going on. I, on the other hand, showed up because it was a Wednesday. We'd get the third game fired up on table six, and the lineup was damn good. I'd buy in for 2,000 matching one of the bigger stacks in the other game. First hand was not one for the highlight reel, but I'll show it anyway. It comes when we get a plus one limp in front of the rock. The low jack is a tight player who makes it 40. I have five seven of spades in the high jack and make the call. Both the limper and the rock call as well. So with 165 in, the board comes out nine seven deuce two spades, giving me a pair and a flush draw. Check to the low jack who bets 80. I consider just raising him here, but Truth be told, I was concerned about the plus one limper and didn't want to blow MP1 out of the pot, so I just call. Sure enough, the limper jams all in for $590. MP1 goes out, and the original better thinks for a second and folds as well. So now it's back on me in a heads-up pot. There are certain players in this player pool that I absolutely hate doubling up, and this is one of those guys. I just don't understand the guy's deal. He went from being barred from a casino to just being a grinder in this game every single day. It's just very weird, and he always plays extremely nitty. So when you have a pair and a flush draw and a lot of money starts to go in, usually your pair is going to be no good and your draw is going to miss. So I just dump the hand and move on. Also, I wasn't brokenhearted when he doubled up the game's biggest action player three hands later. Over the next two hours, the room would continue to fill up at a point probably never seen on a Wednesday. I'd get dealt one playable hand over that stretch and wouldn't win it. Four players would end up $500 richer, though, with their names being randomly selected from this massive bin of tickets. I then spew off $320 running a bluff with the skinny. Losing to a guy who called 70 preflop with the king six offsuit. I'd lose a few more small pots, and I was now down over $500 despite barely even playing a hand on the day. Under the gun one makes it 25. MP1 and MP2 call. I have eight 10 of hearts in the cutoff, and I make the call with the button also coming in. So with 130 in, the flop comes ace, jack, six, all hearts, giving me a flush. Check to MP2, who makes it 40. I raise to 110 here, and after thinking about it forever, he finally completes with the others going out, and with 350 in, the turn changes nothing, and I bet 125, and this time he barely thinks about it at all before folding, but the hand did get us on the scoreboard on the day. Under the gun straddles, and I have King's MP2 and make it 40. Low jack calls, as does the straddle. So, I have pocket Kings against the two opponents I wanted to get action from. That was the only thing that went my way in this hand. As with 125 in, the flop came out ace, jack, jack, rainbow. Under the gun bets out for 60 here. Given just how loose he's capable of being, I decided to call him, but deep down I knew that it was a stupid call. 
Low Jack folds, and with 245 in, the turn is a 7, and now he bets at it again. This time, I decided to throw the kings away, and he did indeed show me Ace-10 offsuit. I then got in several more hands against that same opponent. First, wasn't all that interesting. I actually flopped three jacks, and he barreled the flop and the turn before giving up on the river, saying that he figured that I was going to call, and he obviously was right. This is a mid-session update. I don't think there's ever been so many people that were fired up that the Golden Knights advanced as there were at the Pepper Mill Poker Room this week. And that has nothing to do with hockey. It has to do with the fact that there was one bandwagon jumping Oiler fan that has been so obnoxious all year that when his team was eliminated and the obnoxiousness stopped, everyone else joined together in blissful celebration. And that's the end of the update. By the way, I love how, as you can see in the Las Vegas Sun, Golden Knights fans threw hats on Jonathan Marcheseau's lawn after he scored three goals in a clinching game in Edmonton, where obviously no hats would be thrown there with no Vegas fans in attendance. I am so damn fired up about this team. Anyway, after emerging victoriously in that last hand, I was in the winner's straddle with pocket queens and made it 40, getting action from the same opponent, this time in the cutoff. With 85 in it comes 10 8 3 2 spades, and I bet 60. Cut off things for a second and clicks it back to 120. This wasn't the optimal play, but I thought it would be fun to just three bet click it back once again. So that's what I did. I raised it to 180. I was obviously hoping he would re raise here and I could just get it all in, but he doesn't. Though he does think about it for a second and would make the call. So with 445 in, the turn is the seven of hearts. I bet another 125 here in an effort to keep hands like Jack-10 in the pot, and he doesn't think too long with it before making the call. So with 695 in, I get a pretty bad river card coming the six of diamonds, putting a one-liner to a nine on the board. I figured that it was a spot to still make a small bet, and then I would have to begrudgingly fold should he decide to raise. I put it 140, and he gave it a decent amount of thought, but finally decided to call. Creating a $975 pot, I turn over my hand, and he promptly turns over his like he has me beat, but he doesn't. He just tables the ace-10. I would then open $30 under the gun with 10-7 suited, also known around these parts as the Sammy Special. Hijack calls, and the cutoff, who straddled, then raises to 80. Now, the main reason I chose to open this hand in the first place was to play it against him, so I'm clearly not folding it here. The hijack calls as well. So with 245 in, the board came out. King, 9, 3, 2 spades, and I check. Cutoff bets 80 here. I could potentially raise this, but if he has a king, he's simply never going to fold it. So I figured the play was just a call. Hijack folds, which was good news. And with 405 in, a turn is an offsuit 6. I check, and the cutoff simply checks this one back. And the river is the 6 of spades, giving me the flush on what is now a paired board and I'd proceed to make a mistake. Knowing this opponent, it just really felt unlikely that he would check the turn if he had anything decent. But I still decided to bet 150 here, hoping that he did have something good. He didn't think too long before folding the hand. Based upon the speed of that fold, I put him on a hand maybe as good as a pair of eights, but I would say that's even unlikely. Either way, I definitely should have checked that river to him. That same concept would come into play in this next hand that I'd play against him. You'll notice I wasn't exactly waiting for super premiums to defend the rock when he raced. In this hand, with 95 in, we go three ways to 6, 7, 9, 2 spades. A pretty good flop for my jack 8. By the way, a lot of 2 spade flops today. Anyway, I'd check. He bet 60 from the cutoff, and the button would go out. So with 215 in, the turn is a brick. But the good news is... It goes check, check, allowing a spade to peel off on the river. Given the fact that he showed no strength on the turn, this is a must bluff. I fire 150, and he doesn't take too long with it before throwing his hand into the muck. I wouldn't get to play any more hands against him, though, as he bailed after getting felted by the player on my left straight over straight. 
obviously an unfortunate development. The room would fill up even more. I asked Mike Nelson how many of these players he felt would normally be here and how many were only here because of the drawing, and he said the same thing that De Niro said about his desert meeting with Pesci in Casino. Yeah, about 50-50. I didn't lose back 160 with eights on a six-high board when I folded turn when it was abundantly clear I was up against a bigger overpair. So I was up on the day, but barely. We'd get a couple of limps, and I looked down at King Queen of Spades on the button and make it 40. This may not come as a shock, but uh, all four of my opponents who had cards decided to match my bet, and with 200 in, it comes Queen 4 3 Rainbow, and I bet 75. The hijack would check Call Me Here with the others going out, and with 350 in, the turn was another three. This time I'd bet 100, and once again, he checked Call. So with 550 in the pot, the river was yet another three. He'd check for a third time, and this time I would just bet 125, hoping that he'd call me with one of his small pairs. And I really think that this is where he finally talked himself in to folding a four. And the pot got shipped in my direction. The lineup on table six really started to get bad, so I switched to the one on table two, which was the fourth 5-10 game. And right when I got there, I ran really good, as I won one of the $500 drawings. So I increased my stack significantly with those bonus tax refunds. And if that wasn't good enough, I was sitting right next to Mr. C for another edition of Slick Central. All right, Slick. What do you mean yeah. your power rank? Your top three vodkas? Because I know this is a subject that you are well versed on. We have a problem, Houston. Because we got to go down to the Red Square at Mandalay Bay where they have extremely high-end Russian vodkas. So whatever vodkas are going for at least 40 bucks a shot and over, those would be my favorite. And they are absolutely exquisite. Trust me on this. What is the most you've ever paid for a shot of vodka? Uh, it was between a stripper's legs and she charged me 100 bucks and she poured it down my throat. Experiment Rhino. I wish I documented it on a phone, but I was slightly inebriated. I won the drawing, but couldn't get any playable hands on the new table. I actually kept getting dealt the Robbie, which was not good unless the board looked like this. I'd finally pick up jacks and open a 35 under the gun. Plus one would call, and then MP2 jams all in for his last $130. Folds back to me, and I obviously make the call with the other player folding, and with 300 in, I really wish that I'd actually gotten to play a regular multi-way pot, given the fact that the flop came in such a way that I didn't even have to sweat that one. Unfortunately, I'd lose back a good percentage of that money in the final hand of the day, and I'd play it against the pro MC when I had pocket queens. I'd raise them and get action from him and several others en route to a king high flop, but the more unfortunate thing was the fact that I was out of time, and this kind of extravaganza drawing giveaway day made it a day where it's definitely better to play a little longer than regular days, as I was talking about on my last vlog. So, needing to go pick up my son, I'd rack up and book the win. Okay. All right, wrapping this up. Yes, dear. Now, I just spoke to Slick. Yes. Are you stunned, and I can ask Raina about this too, she might, she's probably stunned about this. <laughs> Are you stunned the fact that when I brought up drinking vodka, that Slick then mentioned how he did that at the Spearmint Rhino with a stripper on his lap. Like, does, does that stun either one of you guys? Well, it takes an awful lot to shock this young woman, but um, no, not at all. Absolutely not. <laughs> That's, that is uh, Mr. C. All right, wrapping up just over a six hour session, which might be a little bit longer, as I mentioned in the last vlog, than I would like to target, given the success that I've noticed in that regard. But obviously with the money giveaways today, uh, justifies staying a little bit longer, and it ended up working out quite well. Obviously I hit that drawing, and that was a large portion of the profits I made on the day, because I didn't run particularly great. Uh, on a lot of the hands that didn't get shown on the vlog particularly, but uh, 
Still a $1,067 win, which obviously I will take. We did have some absolute legends of the game in here for this drawing today. Unfortunately, I did not have more time to play with them and uh, extract a little bit more, but a win is a win and I won't complain. And speaking of things that worked out nicely, we got a good question of the week this time. All right, let's get a question of the week in here. You can always do that by either going into the comments below on the vlog or going to Instagram at Ben Deach, and I will address on this section at the end of the vlog, uh, should they be interesting enough to do so with. And James Carabini sends in one that I think is a good one. He says, Ben, I note that you stay put on the table, most likely when you find a good seat to film from. Ms. T moved twice during this session. And he says, I never move. What are your thoughts on this? Are they looking for the lucky seat? Or is it strategic to get to the left of a loose aggressive? Now, first of all, credit to James. He's just paying a whole lot of attention in these logs. And I, for one, appreciate that. But the seat change thing in poker is very interesting. And it's one where I've noticed that there are two types of people. And that is, number one, uh, and this is typically the case of older players, they do just have their favorite seat. They want to be on either the two, the three, the seven, or the eight seat, or they want to be on the one, the nine, the four, the five, or the six seat. Usually people fall into categories where they want to be on one of those two. Either they like to be able to be closer and see the cards, or they like to have that view from the end of the table so they can see everything or just uh, for whatever reason that's just where they like to be and that is not a good reason necessarily for wanting the seat I don't think it's just like your favorite seat I think you're giving something up there now as James said for the purposes of the vlog yes I've noticed it's way better to be on the two the three the seven or the eight seats to do it from because then you just get a better view and I think that I have proven over the course of five years that nobody shoots better in-game video of hands than me when it comes to poker vlogs, no one, because when I'm giving you a full view of the entire game and often you can see exactly what my opponents do, I think that, uh, you know, that really adds something to the videos. But in terms of me, I've tried to kind of fall right in the middle of these two things. Uh, I often make the joke that I can win and lose in all nine seats, and that has indeed been the case. Um, but I try to, when I'm not doing a vlog, I try to move seats at a decent clip, but not overdo it. Some guys, it seems like they move seats more than they play hands uh, in my game. I mean, there's a guy that I nicknamed Table Change Tommy that uh, definitely falls into that category. He's not just table changing, but he's seat changing, and he's constantly jockeying for position uh, and, I think, getting up and smoking cigs. But he's never really playing too many hands. I try occasionally, yes, to get on the left of the loose player, but I don't do it to the degree that some others do. I, I had a first ever occurrence happen about two weeks ago. I, I don't believe that it had ever happened to me before where a seat had opened up and I'd said, I'd like to take that seat. And then someone else says, oh, no, 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 no. I have a seat change button. It seems like something that might happen a lot. To me, I don't believe it had literally ever happened until this one individual who I believe makes $500,000 a year at his job, but takes every dime that he wins or loses at a poker table like it's life or death. Uh, he wanted to, he had to make sure that he got on my left. And I just thought that was hilarious in and of itself. But, um, but I would say move seats to get on the left of the most aggressive players, yes. But if you're ever somewhat unsure then just don't do it because some people they definitely do hit those like and subscribe buttons it's great for this channel and i genuinely appreciate it follow on instagram at ben Deach, and we'll see you back here next time